Today's episode of the WAC Podcast is presented by Hercules Tires. Now here's your host, Eric Danner. Welcome to the WAC Podcast. My name is Eric Danner along with Rachel V. Hill here in our first segment. And, and Rachel, we'll, we'll get to what we did the, this past weekend. But first, we, we had the event we've been waiting for uh, for the last 10, 12 weeks, the Major League Baseball draft. Nick Gonzalez gets drafted, goes number seven to the Pittsburgh Pirates. So I have to tip my hat to you as we predicted last week. You said he would go between seven and nine, and you were absolutely correct. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was actually, so I was headed to the mountains and I'm like streaming the draft on my phone and I'm getting down to pick five and I'm like, okay, like this could be it maybe. And then of course I lose service right in that moment. I'm like, <laughs> Eric, text me what's happening. And I actually right. caught it just as they like went into his house to show the reaction. So it's always my favorite part. So that's what I really wanted to see, which I was happy about. And of course, so happy for Nick. That's awesome for him. Yeah, it's going to be a pretty cool. Our next segment, we're going to go three wide, as they say in NASCAR. We're going to bring in Adam Young, and he was embedded at the Nick Gonzalez's house and get his thoughts on what it was like to be there and, and what his thoughts are on Nick going to Pittsburgh. Because I know Adam's been in demand as well. He was on a on a radio show in uh, Pittsburgh uh, this past weekend. Yes, I know. So exciting. I like wish I could have been there, obviously. Um, Nick and Adam have a great relationship, too. So I know they had a lot of fun. And just the excitement and being in the house and, you know, the nerves going up to it. I'm sure Adam's going to have some great stories to tell. And I know Nick was working out like hours before. So that's not surprising at all. But must have been fun to see. Yeah, and he had a good crowd at his house there. And uh, Nick Gonzalez uh, is going to be on uh, Whack All Access on Instagram again this week. Yeah, so he was on two weeks ago, and we kind of talked about pre-draft, but now we're going to talk about the actual day, what it was like leading up to it, and then when he heard his name being called, what that was like. So super excited to sit down and talk with Nick. Obviously, I'm sure his emotions were kind of all over the place on the day of, but um, we're obviously very excited for him, and I'm sure he's excited too, and to see what the next steps are for him. Well, Nick going number seven, he's the first first-round pick in the WAC since 2011, which was Colton Wong, first top 10 pick since 2005 that was wade townsend uh and he had a, an interesting story where he was actually drafted twice he, he went eighth in 2004 and also went eighth in 2005 uh obviously nick going seven was above that so the highest pick since 2004 uh when a couple of rice pitchers were also taken that was back when they won the national championship had three guys taken in the top 10 uh, from their pitching staff so quite an accomplishment for nick gonzalez so we're very happy for him but he was not the only a WAC player drafted, Rachel. We had uh, Cade Meckles from uh, Grand Canyon University was uh, a fourth round pick. Cade was our preseason pitcher of the year. Obviously, we didn't get to see him a whole lot this year. He was drafted in 2019 in the 40th round, comes back to play at GCU, and, and he goes in the fourth round. So that's uh, seemingly a much better position for him with the White Sox. Yeah, so he had actually decided to go back to Grand Canyon, finish out her, his senior year with the Lopes. But he got Tommy John surgery last month, Eric. So he actually won't be pitching for another year. But Yeah, uh, pretty amazing awesome that, that, that he did get drafted. Because uh, if you saw the Quinn Cotton had, uh, re had tweeted, he was, he was filming with his phone. And they showed Cade, and he had the big thing on his arm. I was wondering about that, and I didn't find that. So good research by you, Rachel, to find out that he had the, the Tommy John surgery. So, yeah, and it kind of makes you wonder what's going to happen with, with Nick and with Cade and, and what's going to happen exactly with, with these guys as there is no minor league baseball. Hopefully there's going to be major league baseball. Seemed like a, a done deal maybe a few weeks ago, but kind of still up in the air, Rachel. Yeah, I have no idea what's going to happen with the MLB. Uh, I think maybe Adam might be able to kind of see who uh, Nick talked to to see if there's any idea what the next couple of weeks will be. So I definitely want to talk to uh, Adam about that. But I have no idea for baseball what's going to be going on. I know there was supposed to be a July 4th start, but it doesn't seem like that's going to happen now. So, you know, I'm ready for sports to get back. I know a lot of other sports are coming back, MLS or NBA, but no MLB. Yeah, Rachel, we talked about that a little bit last week as we taped the show on Mondays. Uh, the MLS had not yet announced that they were coming back, I believe, when we did the show last week, and they're going to do the, the World Cup-style uh, tournament in July in Orlando, as the NBA is also planning on going to Orlando. But uh, the NBA, some players this past weekend coming out saying, uh, maybe, hey, not so fast. We're not ready to go back and play yet. Yeah, I... 
tip my hat to everybody because I know everything going on in the world right now is very sensitive topics and they obviously are trying to get a message across but I think a lot of players will follow after LeBron and say that they can still spread this message even while they're playing the game of basketball so for the NBA I have a feeling most players I'm going to go 90% will end up playing even though they are trying to really push this message about social right. justice. Any, any figure that the message will probably get out even more when they do have the platform when they're actually playing games and and all of our attention is on the NBA because there really isn't a whole lot else going on at, at that time. I'm sure there's going to be shirts. Uh, you, you know, they always show players walking into the arenas. I'm sure there's going to be outfits. I'm, I'm sure Instagram captions, it's going to be everywhere. So I don't think it's going to disappear at all. I think it's just going to be a greater attention span, like you said, because everybody's going to be watching. So this is a GCU week uh, for Whack Top Play. And I know the GCU fans uh, – a, a rabid fan base, uh, and they'll, they'll be out voting. And uh, GCU in the news this past week as well, uh, Rachel, in men's basketball, they announced that they will be hosting Arizona State, which seems like a no-brainer. They're only eight miles apart, the two campuses, but they have not played since GCU went Division One. In fact, they haven't played a regular season game against each other since 1980. So, uh, again, a, a tip of the cap, uh, hats off to uh, the administrations at GCU and Arizona State for finally – hammering this out. Arizona State uh, was not willing to participate against GCU for a number of years, and, and now it seems uh, that that has uh, gone away, and, and we look forward to seeing the Sun Devils against the Lopes. Yeah, you know, Eric, if you really want to just, like, send me out to that game, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, December 13th, I believe, is the date uh, 4 o'clock start, and that's going to be at home at home, so uh, the plan will be to play at GCU, which that, that's pretty interesting, too, that the first game will be at GCU, and then the following year, uh, GCU returns the favor going to Arizona State. So uh, that, that should be a lot of fun. Obviously, the Havocs will be out in force, and we, we've seen how, how they go out. If you remember a couple of years ago when they played that, that game at the uh, Phoenix Suns Arena at uh, Talking Stick, and I believe there was a doubleheader, and the Havocs, I don't remember if they were cheering for Arizona or against Arizona, but had some sort of impact on the game. You know, the Havocs are such a fun group. I feel like they're going to camp out for this one, too. Yeah. They always camp out before the beginning of basketball season, but I feel like this game they could really camp out and just, you know, go full force. I'm sure tickets are going to fly off the walls for that one. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we, we saw, uh, I think, our last graduation uh, of the year was uh, Seattle U. Of course, they're on the quarter system, so their schedule is a little bit different than some of the other WAC schools, and they had their – their online graduation was kind of fun to see them tweeting out all the, uh, uh, the athletic department anyway from their uh, Twitter account, uh, tweeting all the athletes that graduated in their, their caps and gowns. And uh, again, what we're looking forward to school starting, but uh, that, I think that was the last uh, school graduating uh, before we get started for uh, 2021. Yeah, I'm really happy that, you know, some student athletes have been able to do some sort of graduation. I know a lot of them didn't get to actually walk across the stage and accept their diplomas, but I still think it's fun to be able to see them, you know, take the cap and twit or turn it, whatever the tassel, however you call that. Uh, so it's fun to be able to see them do that. I, you know, my heart breaks for them all not to be able to walk, but it seems like they had a great time and they've been able to do pictures and some sort of party per se. Uh, so it's been fun to see all of them. I know Morgan Means, his dad tweeted out something too. So it's been exciting to see. I'm happy for all of them. Well, we, we as I mentioned, this is a, a special edition of the uh, WAC podcast. So when we come back, we're going to talk to Adam Young, the director of broadcasting for NM State Sports Properties. You're listening to the WAC podcast. We would like to thank our partners, Hercules Tires, Ticket Smarter, and Adidas. Now, back to the WAC podcast. Welcome back to the WAC podcast presented by Hercules Tires. As promised, we are now joined by Adam Young, the director of broadcasting for NM State Sports Properties. Adam, welcome to the show. Our first time with three people on camera for those watching uh, on YouTube. Uh, Adam, uh, first off, I want to ask you, what was it like being in uh, Vail, Arizona at the household of, of Nick Gonzalez this past week? Yeah, this is really cool, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, I was just telling you off the air that, I mean, it was one of the coolest things I've seen and I've done here uh, to be part of that and to see Nick for 48 hours before the draft. And then, of course, to see the draft as well. It was really, really cool. And, uh, you know, you got to see an emotional side of the family and 
uh, you got to see the behind the scenes of draft day, which was absolutely awesome. You did a great job of kind of showcasing all of the things Nick was doing beforehand. I know he was working out, but how were the nerves actually before the draft? Yeah, you know, honestly, Rachel, it seemed like he was still the same person. Um, I thought he would get really emotional when the selection happened. And honestly, he just hugged his parents, hugged his family and, um, you know, went on with it. So he seemed the same to me. I think the parents were a little more nervous and emotional than they usually are. Mike and Jill, who are phenomenal people. He just comes from a really good family. Uh, everybody's humble, genuine. Uh, they care about everybody else, and uh, to see that side of them was really, really neat. And uh, Nick, honestly, he seemed like nothing was going on the day before the draft or even the day of the draft. He just kept on working hard and was getting his work in. He was in the weight room. He was getting his swings in, and, uh, and then the draft happened, and he was genuinely happy to be uh, selected by the Pittsburgh Pirates. So Nick goes number seven to Pittsburgh. I predicted – Number four last week, Rachel, of course, was spot on with her prediction going seven to nine. Going to Pittsburgh, and kind of the way the draft went, it was a little unusual from all the mocks that we've been looking at. Uh, Nick, I believe, was the first non-Power 5 player selected, and also no high school players uh, selected ahead of Nick, which is not a normal draft per se, but it seems like Pittsburgh's a really good place for him to go. I think it is. I really do, and to your point, the draft was wacky. You know, I, I was paying attention to mock drafts for months before, believe me, especially during the pandemic. All I had was mock drafts. And then Heston Kerstad goes number two and Meyer goes number three. And at that point, you're like, okay, everything's kind of thrown out the window. Asa Lacey's still on the board and Austin Martin was still on the board. Uh, I think Pittsburgh's a really good fit. I don't know a ton uh, about their farm system. I've done more research since the draft has happened, and I've talked to some people in Pittsburgh doing some interviews, and they feel like he can fly through the system. I mean, the system isn't loaded. The big league club has kind of struggled the last couple of years. So this does seem like a really, really good fit for Nick. And I've said this before, too. I think he's so mature and he's so pro-ready that I don't think he'll have many hiccups along the way. When you draft a 21-year-old, you expect – there to be some growth and some maturity as, as life goes on because they're going to start growing up on a bus. And I feel like Nick is so regimented. He's so focused on everything he does that he shouldn't have a big issue with the transition from the college level to the pro level when you're on your own and you don't have people telling you what to do every single day. I think he'll, he'll bode well with that. Do they know what the upcoming future is going to look like? Did they give him any information at all that you can say? Not that I know of. I, I think normally he'd probably, you know, just start at single A and go from there. But with everything going on, this has been such a weird year where there's really no baseball to be played right now. So he's not going to go anywhere immediately. Uh, I guess, you know, the potential of, you know, the fall league or winter ball somewhere probably would be in his cards just because he hasn't played in a while. And he's itching to play. I mean, he's going to work every single day and he's, you know, he's taking cuts in the cage and he's lifting and he's getting better physically. And I know he's had some live work, but I know he's itching to play in a game just like anybody else. And hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Now, the fortunate part for Nick is now he's one of their top prospects. So, mm -hmm. you know, if there's games to be had, you better believe Nick Gonzalez will be part of them. Talking with Adam Young, the Director of Broadcasting for New Mexico State Sports Properties. And Adam, uh, we were just mentioning you, you were there when he got drafted. Uh, when they made the selection, when the commissioner gets up there and he says shortstop, is there any rhyme or reason to that? Do they expect him to be a shortstop? Obviously, he can switch positions, but is he going in expecting to play shortstop or second base? That's an interesting read. I like that, Eric. Uh, <laughs> I think it's still to be determined, to be honest. Um, I've heard from people leading up to the draft that some organizations might give him the chance to play shortstop right away. If he fails, then you slide him over to second base. And you know that he can be an above average second baseman professionally. So I think that is still to be determined. I've told people before, too, that if you throw him out in center field, I saw it his freshman year. He is outstanding defensively in center field. So um, we'll see where they place him. 
I guess second base is probably the safe choice. Shortstop, he showed this year he could play there, and he has shown uh, collegiately and in his life that he can play in center field as well. He's athletic, um, and wherever you put him, he's going to work harder than anybody else to be the best at that position. So whether that's short second or somewhere else, he'll, ju he'll be just fine because he's an outwork everybody uh, to get ready to play defensively at that particular position. You've obviously got to watch Nick grow and mature over the last couple of years. And what areas do you really think that he's matured and given himself a really prosper, prosper, I cannot talk anymore. I swear my job is talking and I can't do it. <laughs> uh, which way have you really seen that you think maturity will go on for him in the um, big leagues? Yeah, I think physically, Rachel, um, he's gotten bigger. Um, he's not the biggest guy out there. I think he's listed 5'10", 190, but he, he's, he's built. I mean, he, he can lift some weight. There's no question about it. So he's really worked hard in the weight room. Uh, plate discipline improved a lot from his freshman year to his sophomore year. You saw his strikeout numbers go down, his walk numbers uh, go up in that regard. And then defensively, I mean, he improved a lot. Like, he was not – the same middle infielder this year that he was last year and especially um, what he was as a freshman. I saw him improve a lot in that area. Uh, base running as well. The reason why he went to Katuit on the Cape was because their head coach Mike Roberts who used to be the head coach in North Carolina is known as the base stealing guru and uh, that was one of the areas where they felt like Nick could improve his draft stock. So he learned a lot from coach Roberts on the Cape and I think he's improved in all areas. His power numbers have gone up every single year. Uh, his walk numbers went up. And this year, when people weren't pitching to him, he wasn't giving in. I mean, he, he was not uh, biting at stuff that, um, that normally I think hitters would go after. You know, he was just fine taking a walk, which was cool to see. When we uh, saw the stories that they're doing about Nick, uh, of course, uh, Jessica Mendoza interviewed him. And and some of the sidebar stories there. I, I was unaware of his, his brother's story and, and yeah. having gone to Navy and, and being a, a member of the military. Uh, how did he uh, fit into the, to the whole celebration there uh, when you're at uh, Nick's house this past Wednesday? Well, it's really cool. And I think this might've been the coolest part of the reaction video. So his brother, Daniel played college football at Navy and was a captain, a linebacker. He was a stud. He's 6'3", 230, built like a brick house big, big dude. And he's been a big role model for Nick uh, his entire life. So uh, Daniel went to Navy. He's stationed in Japan. So he couldn't be there, but they were able to get him in through Zoom or Skype or FaceTime. So he was actually on the TV screen that was facing um, our reaction video camera facing the actual television screen. So you could see Daniel raising his arms and going nuts in Japan before anybody else. And uh, that was really, really cool to see that he could still be part of it, uh, be right next to his family. And I know he can't wait to get back to the States to see Nick and give him a big old hug. Uh, but Nick has called him one of his biggest role models. And a big reason why Nick went to New Mexico State is because Daniel went to Navy. So Nick practically never got to see him play when he was in college. And Nick wanted to go somewhere close to home so his parents could come see him play, his sister could come see him play. So he chose New Mexico State, which is honestly an easy three and a half hour drive from Vail. And uh, he kind of flipped the script on him a little bit because Daniel went so far away. So um, you know, that was cool to see. I think that's, uh, that's an underrated aspect of the reaction video and just the whole draft day for Nick was uh, getting a chance to have his brother um, virtually be there and be part of it. I loved watching that video because, yeah, you noticed his brother yeah. reacting way before anybody else. So you're like, oh, this is happening, obviously. Uh, really exciting. But for you, you've obviously been around the program and everything. Has his parents gone out to a lot of games to watch him at New Mexico State? Were they regulars at the baseball diamond? Oh, yeah. If they weren't there, there was something wrong. You knew Mike and Jill would be there. They had an RV uh, with Aggie stickers all over it. And uh, one of the coolest things – uh, that Brian Green did when he got here, he said, I, I want to build an RV program. And uh, I mean, he really did that. And it carried over into this year uh, with head coach Mike Kirby in his first season. There were so many RVs out there and it was really cool to see. And uh, his family was part of it. Three and a half hour drive. Uh, they would bring their RV out every single weekend. Uh, his dad was there pretty much every fall weekend if there was an inter-squad scrimmage. So very close family. Um, 
but they're not the family that's, you know, out there saying, look at my kid. You, you wouldn't even know it. They're behind the scenes. Uh, they love watching their son go after his dream and they're fully supporting him, but they're behind the scenes for sure. Talking with Adam Young and you mentioned Brian Green who uh, recruited Nick and uh, the story is that Nick was a, a walk-on at least his, his first year there. And uh, as you mentioned, Mike Kirby took over this past year, so didn't get a full season with Nick. But I know Brian was also a, a big part of uh, this celebration as well. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it's cool to see how many people were part of his journey. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it's one of those things throw. where so many I people helped him left the way field. and uh, see got a you later. And Home Like you said, he was a preferred Alex. walk-on, which is – absolutely no incredible there. and um you know he came here thinking that he would play as a freshman a and get a chance to prove side. to the coaches that he was college ready and then he'd get on scholarship in year two which is what happened he told his parents he said look you're just got to pay for one year i'll get on scholarship in year two and uh he proved a lot of doubters wrong and, and he really built uh quite the name here in the southwest i love that i on it it's those are the best stories you know, when they're walk-ons and then they become this big superstar almost. And you're just so happy to show that hard work always does kind of triumph all. I, I love that story about Nick. Honestly, you could argue that the two best players in program history were walk-ons. Daniel Johnson, if you guys recall, uh, was drafted back in 2016 by the Nationals. He was a walk-on as well. So uh, the two guys that, you know, have a really good shot at making it to the major leagues. And there's plenty of others scattered around the minor leagues right now for the Aggies. But uh, the two guys who are elite prospects, uh, they were both college walk-ons, which, you know, I think it's a cool story for any young kid thinking about, you know, going somewhere as a walk-on. Well, you know, those two guys turned into uh, something pretty special. Was there a good amount of teammates there for the Aggies at Nick's house? Or did he have any friends? I know Joey Ortiz and him are still pretty close. Was yeah. he able to go? Yeah, there were a couple. You know, it, it's hard now because of social distancing and everything. I think it was different than, than most years. But, um, you know, the pandemic, because of the pandemic, uh, the draft was not in Omaha because, you know, before it was supposed to be in Omaha. And I'm assuming it probably would have been close family only, kind of a green room type scenario. Uh, but this was a little different. So he was able to do it in his hometown. And um, yeah, Joey was there. And um, I, I talked to Joey day of, I did an interview with Joey and he said, uh, he said that if they're playing ping pong, they're competing against each other. They've made each other better. And I've heard that from numerous teammates, coaches, um, that were around when Joey and Nick were on the same team together. Those two guys pushed each other every single day and they were great for each other. And still to this day, they're best friends. So, uh, it, it's still the same way. Adam, last thing for me, uh, Obviously, with Nick going number seven, we saw Cade Meckles from uh, Grand Canyon go in the fourth mm -hmm. round. Tristan Peterson, there was talk he, he might have a shot. Um, obviously, it, 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 if it was a normal draft, he probably would have been selected probably in the top ten rounds. Any idea what some of those guys who are maybe on the bubble for getting drafted, uh, what their plans are if they're going to try to come back to school or, or try to sign or, or maybe move on? Yeah, I think they're still going through that process where they're trying to weigh their options. Um, you know, Tristan Peterson, of course, put up ridiculous numbers. I mean, he's a pro bat. There's no question. And defensively, he's great over at first base. So he's a pro player. And uh, it's just been a weird year with five rounds. And then it's tough to sign some of these guys, too. There's only so much money. And, um, you know, for somebody like Tristan, he has leverage. I mean, he still has a college year remaining. Uh, Chris Jefferson, another guy who – Undoubtedly, if this was a normal draft year, Chris Jefferson was well on his way to getting drafted, I think, pretty early. Um, uh, Chance Roach, an, another guy that could have potentially uh, got drafted this year. So there were certainly names that we were hearing. And then once it goes to five rounds, everything changes. And uh, for these guys, they have decisions to make. Um, and I think part of the decision, too, is uh, if you do sign uh, this year, will there be baseball for you to play? before uh, next February and next March um, at the pro level. So uh, there's a lot of factors there. And it was cool to see Cade Meckles uh, get drafted. I, I think that was something that might have been a little bit unexpected. I think he was one of the borderline guys where uh, they thought maybe he would go, maybe he wouldn't go. He wasn't in the top 500 from Baseball America. Uh, but we got to see him uh, last year. And I mean, 
if I'm a scout and I'm watching Cade Meckles, the velocity doesn't wow me, but I think he has a big league changeup, and I think that's why he gets drafted um, so early is he has a big league pitch right now. Um, and he was phenomenal for Grand Canyon. So that was cool to see for the conference. And, uh, you know, we'll see how the signings over the next couple of days and weeks kind of go. But, um, you know, tough time, of course, for these guys to make uh, these hard decisions that will affect the rest of their life. What were your thoughts when you heard that the draft was just going to be five rounds? What were your initial reactions? I was really disappointed. I mean, for, for these families, for these guys, because even if, even if you do sign – it's not the same as hearing your, your name called and seeing that on the television screen or getting that call from your agent saying, hey, they're about to take you. And then you get to listen to that and share that moment uh, with your family. Uh, I've talked to a lot of our guys who have been drafted since I've been here the last couple of years. And you know, they talk about that being the best moment of their life so far. And you want that for guys like Tristan Peterson. You, know, you, you want them to experience that moment because you know they've worked so hard for it. Um, it, it's not the end by any means. You can sign, you can come back another year and then get drafted next year potentially. But, um, you know, I know a guy like Tristan was very deserving of that this year. And unfortunately, with the five rounds, you don't get drafted. And there's signability issues there too. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different factors that play into it. But um, the nice thing is the NCAA giving those guys the year back. So you do have some leverage. You can still go back to school and finish out your career if you want to on uh, the high note you wanted to. Well, Adam, I want to thank you for taking some time out. Uh, as, as Rachel mentioned, we we're both jealous that uh, you had that opportunity to, to sit there with Nick because that's a, a moment uh, you're never going to forget and, and obviously a moment that Nick's never going to forget. It was really cool, guys. And I told Nick, I interviewed him like five minutes after it was done. And I said, Nick, I just looked down at my phone and I have like 75 text messages. I can't imagine... Uh, what your phone is like right now. And uh, he said, I haven't even looked at it yet. So that's just the kind of guy he is. He's just focused on uh, everybody in the room and everybody around him. And we can't wait to follow his pro career. And I haven't got my Pirates hat yet, but uh, it's coming soon. All right, that is Adam Young, Director of Broadcasting for New Mexico State Sports Properties. For those listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud, coming up next, we're going to have Mark Knutson, WAC Baseball Analyst, former WAC Baseball player. So we have plenty of more baseball to talk about. You're listening to the WAC Podcast. Thanks for listening to the WAC Podcast. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And check out our website at WACsports.com.